Ten. The people continued. A body politic may be measured in two ways: either by the extent of its territory or by the number of its people. And there is between these two measurements a right relation which makes the state really great. The men make the state, and the territory sustains the men. The right relation, therefore, is that the land should suffice for the maintenance of the inhabitants, and that there should be as many inhabitants as the land can maintain. In this proportion lies the maximum strength of a given number of people. For if there is too much land, it is troublesome to guard and inadequately cultivate it, produces more than is needed, and soon gives rise to wars of defense. If there is not enough, the state depends on its neighbors for what it needs over and above, and this soon gives rise to wars of offense. Every people to which its situation gives no choice save that between commerce and war is weak in itself. It depends on its neighbors and on circumstances. Its existence can never be more than short and uncertain. It either conquers others and changes its situation, or it is conquered and becomes nothing. Only insignificance or greatness can keep it free. No fixed relation can be stated between the extent of territory and the population that are adequate one to the other, both because of the differences in the quality of land, in its fertility, in the nature of its products, and in the influence of climate, and because of the different tempers of those who inhabit it. For some in fertile country consume little, and others on an ungrateful soil much. The greater or less fecundity of woman. The conditions that are more or less favorable in each country to the growth of population and the influence the legislator can hope to exercise by his institutions must also be taken into account. The legislator, therefore, should not go by what he sees, but by what he foresees. He should stop not so much at the state in which he actually finds a population as at that to which it ought naturally to attain. Lastly, there are countless cases in which the particular local circumstances demand or allow the acquisition of a greater territory than seems necessary. Thus, expansion will be great in a mountainous country where the natural products, i.e., woods and pastures, need less labor. Where we know from experience that women are more fertile than in the plains, and where a great expanse of slope affords only a small level tract that can be counted on for vegetation. On the other hand, contraction is possible on the coast, even in lands of rocks and nearly barren sands, because their fishing make up to a great extent for the lack of land produce, because the inhabitants have to congregate together more in order to repel pirates, and further because it is easier to unburden the country of its surplus inhabitants by means of colonies. To these conditions of law giving must be added one other, which, though it cannot take the place of the rest, renders them all useless when it is absent. This is the enjoyment of peace and plenty, for the moment at which a state sets its house in order is like the moment when a battalion is forming up, that when its body is least capable of offering resistance and easiest to destroy, a better resistance could be made at a time of absolute disorganization than at a moment of fermentation, when each is occupied with his own position and not with the danger. If war, famine, or sedition arises at this time of crisis, the state will inevitably be overthrown. Not that many governments have not been set up during such storms, but in such cases these governments are themselves the state's destroyers. Usurpers always bring about or select troublous times to get past, under cover of the public terror, destructive laws which the people would never adopt in cold blood. The moment chosen is one of the surest means of distinguishing the work of the legislator from that of the tyrant. What people then is a fit subject for legislation? One which, already bound by some unity or origin, interest or convention, has never yet felt the real yoke of law. One that has neither customs nor superstitions, deeply ingrained. One which stands in no fear of being overwhelmed by sudden invasion. One which, without entering into its neighbors' quarrels, can resist each of them single-handed, or get the help of one to repel another. One in which every member may be known by every other, and there is no need to lay on any man burdens too heavy for a man to bear. One which can do without other peoples, and without which all others can do. One which is neither rich nor poor, but self-sufficient. And lastly, one which unites the consistency of an ancient people with the docility of a new one. Legislation is made difficult less by what is necessary to build up than by what has to be destroyed. 
and what makes success so rare is the impossibility of finding natural simplicity together with social requirements. All these conditions are indeed rarely found united and therefore few states have good constitutions. There is still in Europe one country capable of being given laws, Corsica. The valor and persistency with which that brave people has regained and defended its liberty well deserves that some wise man should teach it how to preserve what it has won. I have a feeling that some day that little island will astonish Europe. 11. The Various Systems of Legislation If we ask in what precisely consists the greatest good of all, which should be the end of every system of legislation, we shall find it reduce itself to two main objects. Liberty and Equality Liberty, because all particular dependence means so much force taken from the body of the state, and equality, because liberty cannot exist without it. I have already defined civil liberty by equality. We should understand not that the degrees of power and riches are to be absolutely identical for everybody, but that power shall never be great enough for violence, and shall always be exercised by virtue of rank and law, and that, in respect of riches, no citizen shall ever be wealthy enough to buy another, and none poor enough to be forced to sell himself, which implies, on the part of the great, moderation in goods and position, and, on the side of the common sort, moderation in avarice and covetousness. Such equality, we are told, is an unpractical ideal that cannot actually exist, but if its abuse is inevitable, does it follow that we should not, at least, make regulations concerning it? It is precisely because the force of circumstances tends continually to destroy equality that the force of legislation should always tend to its maintenance. But these general objects of every good legislative system need modifying in every country in accordance with the local situation and the temper of the inhabitants, and these circumstances should determine, in each case, the particular system of institutions which is best, not perhaps in itself, but for the state for which it is destined. If, for instance, the soil is barren and unproductive, or the land too crowded for its inhabitations, the people should turn to industry and the crafts and exchange what they produce for the commodities they lack. If, on the other hand, a people dwells in rich plains and fertile slopes, or in a good land, lacks inhabitants, it should give all its attention to agriculture, which causes men to multiply, and should drive out the crafts, which would only result in deep population by grouping in a few localities the few inhabitants there are. If a nation dwells on an extensive and convenient coastline, let it cover the sea with ships and foster commerce and navigation. It will have a life that will be short and glorious. If, on its coasts, the sea washes nothing but almost inaccessible rocks, let it remain barbarous and ichthyopagous. It will have a quieter, perhaps a better, and certainly a happier life. In a word, besides the principles that are common to all, every nation has in itself something that gives them a particular application, and makes its legislation peculiarly its own. Thus, among the Jews long ago, and more recently among the Arabs, the chief object was religion. Among the Athenians, letters. At Carthage, entire commerce. At Rhodes, shipping. At Sparta, war. At Rome, virtue. The author of The Spirit of the Laws has shown with many examples by what art the legislator directs the constitution towards each of these objects. What makes the constitution of a state really solid and lasting is the due observance of what is proper, so that the natural relations are always in agreement with the laws on every point, and law only serves, so to speak, to assure, accompany, and rectify them. But if the legislator mistakes his object and adopts a principle other than circumstances naturally direct, if his principle makes for servitude, while they make for liberty, or if it makes for riches, while they make for populousness, or if it makes for peace, while they make for conquest. The laws will insensibly lose their influence, the constitution will alter, and the state will have no rest from trouble till it is either destroyed or changed, and nature has resumed her invincible sway. 12. The Division of the Laws If the whole is to be set in order, and the commonwealth put into the best possible shape, there are various relations to be considered. First, there is the action of the complete body upon itself, the relation of the whole to the whole, of the sovereign to the state, and this relation, as we shall see, is made up of the relations of the intermediate terms. The laws which regulate this relation bear the name of political laws, and are also called fundamental laws, not without reason if they are wise. For, if there is, in each state, only one good system, 
the people that is in possession of it should hold fast to this. But if the established order is bad, why should laws that prevent men from being good be regarded as fundamental? Besides, in any case, a people is always in a position to change its laws, however good, for if it chooses to do itself harm, who can have a right to stop it? The second relation is that of the members one to another, or to the body as a whole, and this relation should be in the first respect as unimportant, and in the second as important as possible. Each citizen would then be perfectly independent of all the rest, and at the same time very dependent on the city, which is brought about always by the same means, as the strength of the state can alone secure the liberty of its members. From this second relation arises civil laws. We may consider also a kind of relation between the individual and the law, a relation of disobedience to its penalty. This gives rise to the setting up of criminal laws, which, at bottom, are less a particular class of law than the sanction behind all the rest. Along with these three kinds of laws goes a fourth, most important of all, which is not graven on tablets of marble or brass, but on the hearts of the citizens. This forms the real constitution of the state, takes on everyday new powers, when other laws decay or die out, restores them or takes their place, keeps a people in the ways in which it was meant to go, and insensibly replaces authority by the force of habit. I am speaking of morality, of custom, above all of public opinion, a power unknown to political thinkers, on which nonetheless success in everything else depends. With this the great legislator concerns himself in secret, though he seems to confine himself in particular regulations, for these are only the arc of the arch, while manners and morals, slower to arise, form in the end its immovable keystone. Among the different classes of laws, the political, which determine the forms of the government, are alone relevant to my subject. End of Book 2